Hey everyone, so glad you could join us today. I hope you've got your coffee and you can just relax and sit back and listen to the conversation. Just join us. And today I have, my name is Linda uh, and I'm with Inspired by Her Story. And today I have a new friend, Lisa, with me. How are you doing today, Lisa? I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here. Great, great. So glad you had uh, some time to to join us today. Um, and I know that that uh, when when our listeners are um, hearing the, the the testimony that you have, they will be inspired by your story. It's it's incredible. So, um, so yeah. Now you have told me earlier mm -hmm. that um, as a child you had some health issues. Mm -hmm. So well, I felt sure? like a child. I was 25. I felt oh, like a child. But yeah. Okay. Okay. Yes. I I did feel like a child though, but yes. So yeah. Should I jump right in to telling about that? My yeah. Story? Okay. Yeah. yeah. So a couple of years prior to that, I did become a believer. So when when I uh, at 23, I was um um discovered Jesus and church and this community of Christians that I loved to be around and everything. Um, and then just two years later though, I woke up one morning, very, very sick. Um, I had been teaching full time. I'd gone to college to become a teacher, um, was living a very full, healthy life and getting my master's degree, going to the gym, working all of the things and woke up, um, one morning, very, very sick and had never been sick like that before. This didn't fit my norm. So, um, I knew I felt like God made it very clear that I was to go to the emergency room. So went to the emergency room. And um, when the person behind the front counter saw me, um, that let me know just how sick I was because she actually came out to the waiting room. And I, I've, I've never seen that. I've been to the emergency room a lot since then. Never seen that or experienced that myself. But she came right out and started to like help me right there in the waiting room. Wow. Um, yeah. So that would have been a little bit scary. It you, was like, like it kind was, of a shock that like, oh my gosh, I must be really sick. <laughs> it was very you know? surreal. I was, um, yeah. I was very much in denial. Like, I, like this couldn't really be happening to me. I was, I kind of I felt like an out of body experience. I just kind of like, just kept letting these things happen. Like they're drawing my blood, they're taking my blood pressure. They're telling me I'm going to be here a while. And I just kind of kept like, okay, okay, whatever. Like, mm -hmm. um, and certain things didn't make sense to me. So I would say, no, even though they probably should have done those things, but I just, I couldn't accept that I was as sick as I was. So, oh, um, okay. but actually that very first day that I was in the, um, emergency room, they brought in a kidney specialist and they did further testing because my kidneys and my heart and my liver were all like in distress, basically. All of them. Um, all of them. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. yeah. So um, that doctor that got assigned to me still is my doctor now, 23 years later, but he, um, he just, God really used him to speak wisdom into his life, to show me, to, to reveal to him what was going on with me. He said, I suspect you have something called a H U S and that stands for atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome. I'd never heard of that before. And no. there at that time, there were five people in my state um, that had it. So it's considered an ultra rare disease. So you've all heard of rare diseases, but this is ultra rare, ultra meaning rare. it's just very unlikely that you're, you know, going to have this. At, at that point, were they even recognizing which organ was the problem? It was the kidneys at that point. So okay. um, once... Um, I got some minimal treatment. Um, the liver seemed to kind of calm down. My blood pressure remained very high and unstable, unable to control. And prior to that, I had had low blood pressure. So suddenly it was the opposite. And um, my kidney function was severely affected. Right. It's, well, stress will raise our blood pressure too. So your body would have been in, in extreme stress with, with all this happening. For sure. But yeah, it was really uh, the kidneys that were causing all of that. I learned so much about kidneys that first summer that I was sick, that how much they impact our body. I suddenly I had to be on blood pressure medications because my kidneys couldn't do what they were supposed to do to help regulate my blood 
pressure. And suddenly I had to be injecting myself with this um, hormone to make it. So my body would make red blood cells because my kidneys weren't able to do that. I had to have, um, so I had to have several dialysis um, treatments. It wasn't an ongoing thing. Like they would do it. Um, and then my kidneys would kind of level off a little bit. I mean, I was function. My kidneys were at about like 30% or something at that point. So they were not well, but, um, but enough to where I wasn't having to be on dialysis all the time. It was this and both of your kidneys or just one? Both. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, both. oh my gosh. So the way the disease works is it, um, it causes, um, the red blood cells to break apart and they tend to clump somewhere. Sometimes, oftentimes it's the kidneys. Sometimes it's the brain. I did not have that. It didn't, didn't impact my brain, but they did um, clump in my kidneys, causing parts of my kidneys to basically die off. The blood flow wasn't able to get to those part, parts anymore. Um, so it was a process of then beginning something called plasma phoresis. And I had that regularly for, for months and months and months where um, I would be hooked up to this machine. Again, I'm 25 years old, like having lived this totally healthy life. Um, I had played sports my whole life, really valued my health and took care of my body and everything. And then suddenly I'm hooked up to a machine for hours on end where it would um, remove my blood and then the machine would separate the plasma and the red blood cells, it would return the red blood cells to me and I would get new plasma delivered. Wow, technology is amazing, isn't it? It, it is, it is, wow. yeah. Not that I wanted to experience that technology in, in any way, shape or form. No, no I did not. No, but thank um, God that someone's been able to figure this out. Exactly, for what we do yeah. need it, you know? And it was, yeah, it was, a, um, it was kind of like a Band-Aid to what was going on. It, it didn't, it didn't, um, fix the disease. It didn't stop the process. Like if I tried to go more than, um, a week or so without having plasma phoresis, I'd be right back at, at the beginning of feeling very, very sick, being very, very sick. Um, so it was just like, they're trying to figure out this, what do we do? What do we do with her? I ended up having different types of chemotherapies and high doses of steroids and, and I'm 25 single making these decisions um on my own and thing i am i am so incredibly thankful that you know like i mentioned a couple of years prior to all of this happening i had discovered jesus and um and i did feel that he was with me like during that time i would um i i just sought out more and more like what does he want from me in this and then I would get confused or angry and you know I had all the range of emotions with that like why you know wait I I, I gave my life to you I'm following you why is this happening why? you know yeah um and why aren't you fixing this I keep praying I keep praying and um I did have an experience where um in all of that one time when I was really just feeling disappointed by God, really. Um, I felt this presence of him in my room, my room at home. I wasn't in the hospital at the time, but just that he was there with me while I was crying and he was crying with me. And I didn't really get the significance of that at the time. It was years later that I could see that he was truly with me and even gave me that image of that before I even really knew what that meant, before I really had really dove into the Bible and knew that Jesus was with, he tells us he's with the brokenhearted. And I was completely brokenhearted. I didn't know that he even told me that, but he showed me that. And then when I read that later in the Bible, I'm like, oh, he is with the brokenhearted. He was with me as I was brokenhearted. Yeah, that's beautiful. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so, so in that, in that process, then would you say that that was the, the, that was the biggest thing that he taught you that he was always with you. Yes. I, I, I mean, that was definitely a huge piece. I can recall um, driving to the hospital for my, for those plasma phoresis treatments and listening to worship music on the way and feeling this dread that here I go, I have to go in there again and have this done. And 
Um, I mean, I really dreaded it. They would have to put big needles in my arm to, in, you know, not just the normal like blood draw needles, but it, it was a painful process. It was uncomfortable. I felt like antsy just sitting there for so long. And, you know, so I would dread, but then I'd be worshiping at the same time as I would drive there. And I started to get that, like got glimpses of that, that, you know, the both and idea that people talk about that, like I felt um, extreme dread and worship at the same time, thankful that I could worship and um, disappointed that here I am at the hospital again for this treatment that doesn't really seem to be, you know, is it doing anything? I don't know. I'm just doing what the doctors are telling me to do. So just, and, you said, um, and Lisa, you said this was every week. How long of a process was the actual treatment? Uh, a couple hours every time. Oh, Mm -hmm. yeah and there were times when I would go multiple times a week they thought okay let's try multiple it was really just this guessing game and then eventually it got to where I only was doing it once a month and um and the doctor said you know I don't know what this is doing for you and here's another thing that God did there and that was that I had to let go of that like that I had really been holding on to that treatment and the doctor had been holding on to that treatment and every time I had stopped before it didn't work uh, you know, it didn't last. Um, and finally, when it got to where they were a month apart, he said, I, I, I can't tell you that this is doing anything for you. So um, if you want to try stopping, I'll support that. And so eventually a couple months passed and I decided to do that. And it things kind of held on for a while. And so in that time, I went back to work as to teaching, got married, um, we adopted um, two girls, like, you know, not at the same time, one, and then two years later, another daughter. And um, Beautiful. yeah, and that had been a dream. Like I'd always wanted to be a teacher and I wanted to be a mom. So I was getting to do both. And I think um, I still was not well, that I, I was sick. Um, and, but I was very much in denial because I wanted to be a mom so bad. And and I, I had these two daughters and um, and I wanted to care for them. And I was, I was taking good care of them and doing what I needed to do for them. But I was very tired um, and didn't want to really tell the doctor just how tired I was and some of the symptoms that I was experiencing and everything, because I didn't want to go on dialysis. I thought, well, how right. will I parent these two girls that I've been gifted um, if I am on dialysis and didn't see how that would work out. So he sustained me for quite some time. Um, in that time, I did have another diagnosis. Um, actually, before we adopted our daughters, I was diagnosed with melanoma. Um, I had um, melanoma skin cancer um, that, again, just came out of nowhere, where just a routine check with my doctor, she saw a spot and said she wanted to test it. And it was melanoma. So that was another thing that I had to keep, um, keep in check, I had to be a thorough skin check every six months. Um, and kind of another thing of like, why at this age, God, and, um, you know, I, here I already have this kidney disease and now I have skin cancer to be checked all the time. So um, I kind of, I carried on for years parenting and doing all that I could do until finally the numbers, my lab results were showing, like they were matching up with how I felt and I, and I got real and, you know, talk to the doctor about that. Right. So, um, so he said, it, it looks like it, it would be a good time to have a transplant before you have to use, before you have to be on dialysis. And that was always kind of, I just had this firm belief that I was not going to be on dialysis. I was going to do whatever I could take good care of my body, the best that I could to avoid that. But now he's saying to now to avoid it, it looks like you should go ahead with a transplant. So, um, several quite a few people stepped forward to be a living donor for me um just in case oh, that's so generous yeah yeah wow. yeah a lot so, of times people are having trouble finding donors that that's yeah. you're very fortunate yeah I think it had helped that we had had this story that people I kind of knew people kind of knew what was going on in my life like they knew that I'd been sick they knew we adopted our daughters they kind of I had kind of had this life that people were like wow God's really working in her life and so it, it was like 
um, I tried to be as open as I could. Um, I, well, I'm much more open now, but as I've learned to be more vulnerable and everything, but, um, but people knew what was going on. They cared about our family. And I really got to see that when people stepped forward to, to be tested. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so just in case people don't know, you can donate a kidney. You have two kidneys. <laughs> if they're, if you have two healthy kidneys and the doctor says you're, you're good to, to go, you can donate a kidney. And that tends to be the best um, outcome for the recipient to, to receive from a living donor. Um, so my brother-in-law graciously um, was one that, that went forward, went through all the testing and he was a match for me. They didn't recommend that I receive from a biological family member because the disease I have, have um, the, the disease that I have can be um, uh, a genetic, there's a genetic component. So, okay. Um, okay. so they recommended a non-family member. So he's family, but not biological. So we were all set. He had um, done everything he needed to do to be cleared, to donate to me. Everything was set. I had been teaching at the time. I had a sub set for the rest of the school year for my classroom. Um, things were arranged for my family. My girls were like um, seven and nine at the time. And my brother-in-law and sister um, have kids. So everything was scheduled to be taken care of all, you know, all of our family, everything was taken care of. Well, um, in the testing process for me um, to be cleared to have the transplant, um, it was discovered that I had another spot of melanoma. Um, and so that had to be removed. And all they said was, um, as far as getting cleared to still continue with the transplant, the doctor had said, um, the, the wound just needs to heal. So when you have melanoma, I mean, there's different, sometimes people actually have to have chemo and things like that. I didn't have to have that, but what I did have to have was a pretty deep chunk of skin removed and it was on my foot in a place where they couldn't stitch it up. So it just was this open wound that needed to heal before I could have the transplant. So that had been cleared. Like they said, okay, it's healed well enough. It's going to be okay to go ahead with the transplant. But a week before the transplant was scheduled, um, I received a call. I was just cleaning up my classroom. My daughters were in the classroom and received a call from my doctor saying, we have to cancel the transplant. It was decided that the melanoma was considered to be invasive. So you have to be cancer free for two years. Oh, two and years? For two years, yeah. Oh my gosh, and that, that'd be so disappointing. It was so disappointing. It was just um, just such a shock because I'd finally wrapped my mind around that this is going to happen. And then um, and then now it's not. Well, and you get yourself built up. I mean, like you have to emotionally be ready and get exactly. yourself built up. And you've got everything planned out with your kids and with your school and with, yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like everything was planned. And with the donor know. too. Yeah. All of donor. that. Yeah. There was a lot to uh, coordinate. Yeah, to yeah. And it seemed like it was all good to go. Um, and the doctor felt very bad and everything, but there, we didn't have much discussion because it was so such a shock. I just ended up getting off the phone and um, my daughters were in the classroom with me and they started crying. And even though I thought that I had been like hiding how tired I was and how sick I was, they knew because my oldest said, um, but mom, what are you going to do? You're always so tired. And I, I didn't have an answer and that was not where the place I wanted to be. I, I wanted to look at her and say, okay, this is what we're going to do. But I looked at her and said, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do. And, you know, that made us all cry even, yeah. even more. Yeah. yeah. So it was a, a sad, sad time for sure. And just, uh, it was scary that first 24 hours or so, it was just scary of what is going to happen. Am I going to have to go on dialysis? I had built up dialysis in my mind to be this thing that I was just not going to do. Um, so during that time, like once I, you know, like maybe a few years before this transplant was scheduled, I had began a habit of, um, of regular prayer and trying to listen to God. And, um, and I actually would go into my prayer closet. I'd seen that movie war room. Yes. And I'd go to my, my prayer closet. 
and my daughters knew that mom's in her war room, mom's in her prayer room right now and stuff. Well, that morning when I woke up after the transplant had been canceled, the thought definitely did come to me like, why would I go? Why would I go there? You know, God is not listening to me. He's clearly not listening to me. He clearly doesn't care, you know. And, but, and isn't, uh, isn't that, it's it's difficult when we're so discouraged. Yeah. And, and we need to blame somebody. Yeah. And we, and we blame God and yeah. then feel guilty about it. Yeah. Just, just all these other emotions going on. And, and to actually admit that out loud is scary yeah. to mm -hmm. like, you know, can I, who is safe that I can tell this to uh, that I'm mad at God, you know, yep, but yep. It, that's, that's very, very real, Lisa, that it's, you know, and, and that happens when, um, you know, in an illness or when someone dies or there's a bad accident or yeah. we want to blame somebody. So he gets it. A lot of times he gets yeah. it. So yeah, I really couldn't but if see. You, but if finding somebody that we can be safe with. Yeah. And it, and it does work itself out. But yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I couldn't see. I mean, I wanted to blame the doctor because he called me. But then I'm like, well, he was really just relaying the message. Okay, I'll blame the team that made that. Well, no, they you know, I like I, nothing would work out for me to blame anyone else. So but I did feel like God was calling me to the closet. So I went to the closet, kind of plopped down like I normally did and just sit on the floor, nothing fancy about it. And um, I was just kind of like, wow, oh, you know, that feeling of the next morning after something happens and you're kind of still like trying to decide, did that really happen? Is that, did it really, did that really happen? And defeat. it in fact did and, happen. <laughs> and it's kind of defeat. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so I just started talking and then I found that I was talking to God and going like, you know, why would you, why, why did you lead us down this path just to, you know, pull it out from under us like this? Um, and then that thought really took root in me of why, well, why? And like, just that curiosity of why, why did he do this? Hmm. And started to like, my tears started to dry up and I just started laughing it just felt really surreal. I started laughing and feeling this like sense of wonder of, um, okay, well, what are, what is he going to do? What, what is going to happen now? What, what next? And this sense of curiosity and wonder just took over and security of finally understanding. Like, I don't know that I'd ever, ever really like studied the word sovereign or really talked about it much, but suddenly that word was coming to me. He is sovereign. Like, everything had been planned out. Everybody in my life knew this is what was going to happen. Every human around me, including me, knew this is what was going to happen. But he knew that there was a different way that this was going to happen. And, um, and I got to just rest in that, like, I mean, I've, I'm a planner. <laughs> and I had planned everything out, you know, the meals and everything for after the transfer, all the things, all that I could. And he was like, hmm, actually, I'm the planner. <laughs> I've got a different plan. So, so what, was, what, what did you learn in that process? What, what did he teach you in that process? Mm -hmm. um, really, that I didn't have to fear. I just, I mean, I still struggle with fear. Who doesn't struggle with fear? But I, I was so afraid of making the wrong decision about that transplant. And something I didn't mention is that my oldest daughter had had surgery that same year. And so we were not as major, but anyway, still surgery. And that surgery and this surgery, the transplant, there'd been a lot of fear of like, should I really, do I really have to do that? Because I wasn't on dialysis, you know, I wasn't on my deathbed, you know, it wasn't a have to, it was a, you know, you should probably do this. Um, and so those kind of decisions had always caused me a lot of fear. Like, what if I make the wrong decision? What if this isn't the right time? What, and just to show, he showed me that me and all the other people, all the other humans involved that had made these decisions, like, he, he can stop all of that. Like, don't worry. Like if you go forward, if you, you know, put your 
foot forward in this step that you think you're being led to, it, it's okay. Like I still am in control. I will stop it if I need to stop it. I will make it go ahead if it's supposed to go ahead. And just that sovereignty um, just has caused me so much uh, rest, you know, just when I get to that place, once again, where my mind is kind of reeling, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? And it's like, okay, well, I feel like this is what I'm supposed to do. God's leading me this way. I'm going to go this way. And if it's not, he's going to change the path yeah, <laughs> and I can trust, trust in his timing. Yeah, yeah <clears throat> for sure. For sure. So, um, the next step for my health was that because the disease still was considered ultra rare, but it had been around for a little while now, some further testing had been developed. So um, my doctor had me do that in the meantime, because depending on what that testing showed, it would determine whether I might benefit from this treatment um, that they had come up with. So I had the testing and it was, it looked like, yeah, you know, you might benefit from this. And some people have even found um, a little bit of improvement in their kidney function with this treatment. So, um, so I went ahead with that. I started the treatment and it was at that time, it was an infusion every two weeks. Um, now it's every two months. So, um, so that did buy me some time. My kidneys didn't decline. They got a tiny bit better. I stopped working and I started homeschooling my daughters. So my stress level kind of I mean, any homeschooling moms, you still have, <laughs> you still have stress for sure. It wasn't the same though. Like I wasn't trying to teach them and a classroom full of kids. Right. Um, so my stress level was better. I was receiving this medication and I was able to go about another three and a half, I think almost four years um, before the idea of transplant came up again. So I was well beyond the two year mark, you know, no more cancer during that time. Thank God. Um, and, and so then it was time to look again at having a transplant. Um, and this time though, the doctor said, because of my history of melanoma and this rare disease, he really recommended, I don't have a living donor. I think he really wasn't sure if my body was going to accept this transplanted kidney or not. So, um, so in the meantime, I had been on the transplant list for at that time, like four and a half years or something. And even though I wasn't active on the list, um, that you still build time. So your name kind of keeps moving up the list. So okay. when they said, okay, we want you to, you know, um, we're going to put you active on the list again. Um, it was just two days later that I got a call. Um, well, in the middle of the night. It was, it felt very fast. It felt like, oh my gosh, once again, do I do this God? Like, this is a big deal, you know, but thankfully he had yeah. already showed that he is sovereign. So I got the call and I was like, yep, I will be there. And um, long story short, about you know, less than 24 hours after, after that call, I was coming out of um, surgery and had received this kidney from a young woman who had died. Um, and I had received the gift of her kidney. <laughs> wow. So, wow. yeah. So if you're not familiar with transplants, um, you're always at risk for rejecting because it's this foreign um, tissue in your body. And so you have to be on um, immune suppressants for the rest of your life. So I'm on three different immune suppressants. Um, and they typically start you out on one regimen and um, so the one medication, the one of the main ones that I was on um, is one that they normally do. And of course I get, I understand the doctor was like, this one normally works for people, but for me, it caused terrible side effects. So for a year and a half after the transplant, I felt worse than I did before the transplant. Most of the time I would have little glimpses here and there of feeling like, okay, that just feels pretty good. But then it would, I, I had just severe migraines, um, eye pain, blurry vision, joint pain, um, fatigue, rashes, um, really uh, the cloudy thinking was really hard because I wanted, there was so much I wanted to do. I wanted to write a book. I wanted to do all of these things, um, but I couldn't think clearly and my head hurt so bad. Most of, the, most of the time. So 
um, I started doing my own research and found that there are other medications that people take um, that when they cannot tolerate the one. Um, but my doctor was very hesitant. And I do believe it was like for my own good. He, you know, he wanted the best for me, but he wasn't um, willing to try one of the other medications. And so um, I ended up getting a second and a third and even a fourth opinion, really, um, from doctors that said this other medication, we really think this one might even be more beneficial for you. It even has a less risk of um, skin cancer and um, and in, in all of that. So I ended up going on that medication. That would have been more, that would have been ideal. Yeah. That makes sounded sense. like it all made sense to me, but yeah. I, in that I, I really learned to use my voice and to advocate for myself. I mean, I, I wrote the doctor a letter. I shared with him, like my, the emotional part of me, like, this is not what, um, living is. I don't believe this is what God has for me. You know, he doesn't want me to live this way. He doesn't want me to live in bed. Um, and things like that. So eventually I was able to try this other medication, um, even though it really frustrated the one doctor, like he was clearly not happy. He actually dismissed me from his care and everything. And wow. it's like, okay, you know, and I, I struggled with people pleasing for most of my life. So that was hard for me at the same time. I knew without a doubt, this was well, the route I was supposed to take. And we want to trust our doctors, but yeah, yeah. yeah. But at the same time, we do need to advocate for ourselves. Yes. So you yes. Did, that's that's hard. And you it sounds like you did a really good job. Yeah. Yeah. Good Learned for a you. lot. Good for yeah. you. Yeah. But God would have given you the strength and the wisdom to know how to do that. Yes. Yep. He did. Definitely led me through that and coached me. And again, was just right there with me through it. So as I started to have more and more times of feeling like myself, like it took a while for that medication to get out of my system. And then also the new one wasn't, it wasn't like a supplement or so, you know, it wasn't easy breezy either, but it was much better for my, for me. To, um, so it did take a while for me to just get more clear thinking and all of that. But during that time, as I was recovering one time, I was, um, I was laying in bed, just feeling defeated and, you know, um, discouraged. And what do you have for me, God, all of that. I felt like he said to me, I really sensed him saying to me, Lisa, do you want to get well? And I knew that was from the Bible. I hadn't dove in deep into that yet, but John five, six is where Jesus asked the yeah. lame man that's been waiting at the pool for 38 years. Um, do you want to get well? Yeah. And I feel like, oh my gosh, I feel like he's my, that man is my best friend because I feel like he and I can connect. I feel like I know he must've been like, what, what do you mean? Do I want to get well? You know? And that's how I felt. What do you mean? God, do I want to get well? I'm, I'm using my voice. I'm advocating. I'm trying these different things, you yeah. know, I'm going way out of my comfort zone. Yes. I want to get well. And he just kept showing me more and more of that. Like what he said next to the man was, you know, put down your mat and walk. And, um, and I felt like he was showing me get up out of bed, Lisa and walk. And um, if you know me, I love to walk. That is my thing. I walk every day. Um, it's very rare that I don't get out for a walk. And he just showed me that I, I was still having headaches at that time. But I, whether I walked or not, whether I, you know, helped a friend or not, I still had the headache, whether I stayed in bed or not, and didn't make it worse or better or anything. So I got out of bed. And I felt like I in that I was like leaving that sick victim identity there. And I was getting up and living this new identity. And in that he started to show me he wanted me to be a health coach. And I've always loved health. Um, but that just seemed like, what, really? I like, I have this box of weekly medications that I have to take because of this kidney transplant. Like, would someone want a health coach that requires this box of medication? <laughs> you know, uh, like but you've, I, but you've walked through it. I've walked you've through walked it. Through it. So, and, <laughs> and in his humor and love, the first health co coach client I went through or got to meet with after I went through my year long health coach um, 
program was a kidney transplant patient. <laughs> so she had her box of medication. And um, so he was like, yes, actually, I do want you to be a health coach, even though you have your box of medication. Yeah. Well, and like so, your, your shirt says simple steps. So you're, uh, you're, you're just a couple of steps ahead of her and being able to show her. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yep. Full Steps is the name of my podcast. So oh, okay. that's another thing that I never, never saw that coming, but to have a health related um, podcast. Yeah. As a health coach and I have a partner and she and I both um, love to, to guide people in simple, it's called Simple Steps for the Whole You. Um, and yeah, we, we love to just share some information about health and then um, what God has for you and that and then leave uh, and each each um, episode with simple steps for what a person could do that week to to improve their health very so, good I, yeah. I saw you wearing a t-shirt on your Facebook page and then uh -huh. the, I, th I think it was you but the the shirt says my body is God's home mm. do you, you recognize yeah. this I, yes. I will not shame it hate mm. it rate it discount it forget it yes. misuse it curse it or worship it yeah and that, <laughs> i found that so powerful that's a I really know. strong declaration that our body is god's home and i've and i've seen all of this and how society can get everything so twisted yeah and mm -hmm. and really it's it's how we how we look after it Yep. And how we can um um yes garden garden protect. Yes. The yeah. garden protect. And yes. it's easy to love someone else, but not necessarily ourselves. Yes. So so that's where that would come into play too. Just how are we going to look after and love ourselves? For sure. Yeah. Yeah, that shirt is from um, a ministry that I'm involved with called Revelation Wellness. And um, that is their message. And that was my message before I found that ministry. I went through a secular health coach training program. And then a couple months later, I discovered Revelation Wellness. But in that interim between those two, yeah. I, um, I had started adding that message in like um, Jesus, essentially his love and gentleness and how he sees you, mm -hmm. his voice is not harsh or unkind. His voice will lead you to want to make change. And, um, and then I found revelation wellness or they found me really, I mean, it just feels like it's a stumbling upon kind of thing. And, and that is, it's a God step. It's totally. Yeah. yeah. And, and that's their, their message. And I'm a hundred percent on board with that, that even, um, I think those of us with chronic disease get to even see a different picture of that, of like, there have been times where I've like worshiped my body in a way of like worrying so much about it and, um, and fearing things that were happening and uh, oh, worship the diet. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh, for sure. The whole worship <laughs> is different diets. Yeah. 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 And that's very common. Uh, and then there's the other way of like, like I would do um, constant research and trying to figure out what I could do to feel better. And, and that was a different form. Like I, I was an idol in my life, you know, and, and not, um, not having God first and filtering it through him. So, um, so yeah, that message is near and dear to my heart for sure. It's a good one. So yeah. as a as a final um note to encourage the listeners here, um what how would you say Jesus showed himself to you? Mm. What did he teach you in all this? That this has been a long road. Yeah, yeah. Um I I come back to that that God gave me of Jesus in the corner of my room weeping with me and uh, oh, it just gives me goosebumps today even still just to think about that because um, it's his gentleness and his love that uh, is um, is is with me always and when that um, I 
I wrote a book. I'd love to talk about that for a minute, but um, in my book, Grace-Filled Habits, um, there, I talk about the, um, the inner critic, the critical voice inside of me. And I, as I've talked more and more about this, it sounds like most people I talk to have mm -hmm. dealt with that at some time or another, if not still. Um, that is not Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit. Um, and his voice, like I said, it, it will lead it will lead you to want to care for your body in a really kind, loving way. And, um, and that's what I've learned that, I mean, I, I, there was a time where I felt so much shame. Like when I think about it now, it feels ridiculous. Like how, how could I have felt shame about my illness? I felt so much shame that I was, um, dependent on all those medications. I felt shame that I had to go get this treatment and everything. Like I felt like, what is wrong with me? Why can't I fix this? Um, and that was that inner critic voice. And then, but as, um, as Jesus got in there and showed me more and more of who he really is, um, I, I could see the contrast. Like, no, that is, that is not at all how he is talking to me. He's weeping with me. He's crying with me. He's, he loves me. He wants the best for me. He wants me well. Um, he even has purpose for me in this to coach other women. Um, so that, that would be the biggest thing is that, uh, just his gentleness and, and love, um, are so healing. That's really good. I'm, I, as you're just saying that I'm thinking of all the, all the people, people, but I think mostly women who, um, struggle with body issue. Yeah, and, and I've interviewed lots that have had, you know, plastic surgery and um, extreme diets, um, you know, just all all kinds of issues um, stemming from whatever. But it's it's a yeah. it's a fear of it's it's really a fear. Yeah, yeah, Being lady in fear of not good enough, mm -hmm. and and uh, kind of rooted in that as women. Yeah, it's what society teaches us basically. Mm -hmm. So you've got a you've got a really good book and you've got a really good program. So I'm I'm interested to hear some of your podcasts. So I'll be I'll be posting the um the link to the podcast and and also your book on the uh, the notes at the bottom mm -hmm. there. Yeah, that's that's good, Lisa. Thank you so much for okay. your time. Okay. It's been yeah. it's been really good to hear yeah. hear your encouragement for for. The listeners here and for me so thank you thank you so much yeah, thank you so much it's great to talk with you it's good to get to know you thanks again and for for the people who are new to this channel thanks so much for joining us today if you'd like to subscribe and share this encouragement with your friends and leave a comment and maybe you've got a question for lisa or or myself or just would like to make a comment that's great and we'll see you again next time. Bye-bye for now. Thank you.